Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for being here at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum. I'm Ann Brown with the Richard Nixon Foundation, and it's a pleasure to have you uh, here with us tonight. We will begin our program with the Pledge of Allegiance led by one of our docents, Bob Lyons. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Bob. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to tell you about two great programs happening here in the coming weeks. Next Monday, February 23rd at 7 p.m., the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army, Van Hip, will launch his timely book, The New Terrorism, How to Fight It and Defeat It. And as a special treat, Mr. Hip will be introduced by President Nixon's brother, Ed Nixon. That's next Monday, February 23rd at 7 p.m. On Tuesday, March 10th at 7 p.m., Emmy-winning uh, investigative journalist Cheryl Atkinson will lecture on and autograph her New York Times best-selling book, Stonewalled, about how she was a target of hacking and surveillance while reporting in Washington, D.C. That's Tuesday again, March 10th at 7 p.m. These events are free and open to the public, I, and I encourage you all to attend. Please, you can RSVP tonight if you like in our museum store, or you may go on, online at uh, nixonfoundation.org. Now for our featured speakers. Tom Davis served in Congress from 1994 to 2008, representing the state of Virginia's 11th district. During that time, he served as House GOP campaign chairman for two cycles, first in 2000 and again in 2001. He also served as chairman of the House Committee on Government Reform and Oversight before retiring in 2008. He now serves as director at Deloitte LLP and lives in Vienna, uh, Virginia. Martin Frost served in Congress for 26 years, representing the Dallas-Fort Worth area of North Texas. During that time, he served four years as chair of the Democratic Con Congressional Campaign Committee and four years as chair of the House Democratic Caucus. Mr. Frost is a senior partner in the Washington office of the po Polsonelli Law Firm and resides in Al Alexandria, Virginia with his lovely wife, Joanne Joellen Frost, who has joined us tonight. It is a pleasure to have you with us, Joellen. Thank you so much. The preface of the partisan divide is written by David Eisenhower, grandson to President Dwight D. Eisenhower and son-in-law to the man whose name is on our building, President Richard Nixon. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming to the stage the Honorable Tom Davis. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, I also got my training uh, in the Nixon White House. David Eisenhower was an Amherst classmate of mine. And uh, I remember him taking me down after Cambodia and Kent State and inviting me down to the White House. And I'm sitting there in my jeans and tennis shoes and a T-shirt. And he said, I want you to come in and meet Mr. Nixon. So I walked in and I met him. He said, Mr. Nixon, this is the guy I've been telling you about. And so I was chairman of the Campus Conservative Club. And uh, Nixon offered me a job for the summer. Uh, then when I graduated, I worked there until I was drafted and uh, served in the military. When I came out, I worked the 1972 campaign for him, enrolling at the University of Virginia Law School, uh, and then going out and working the campaign, coming back to law school in November to really get my coursework up. Uh, and then afterwards came out, went to Fairfax, and started my uh, political career. And I left not just, uh, I retired undefeated and unindicted, something I'm very, <laughs> uh, very uh, proud of. What we have done, Martin and I have done a lot of commentary together. He was Democratic campaign chairman. I was a Republican campaign chairman. Uh, we've done a lot of media together, and we started comparing notes, and we thought, you know, what's going on in politics today? This is a far different era than when Nixon or Johnson or you go up even to Clinton. Things have changed markedly over the last 20 years. What's so different? And we started to think about it, uh, put some charts together, and said, you know, we ought to write a book where the average person can understand why these have changed. You still have a lot of good people in politics wanting to do the right thing, 
uh, but they're just unable to because of what we call these macro factors that have taken hold over the last 15 to 20 years. So we explain this, I think, in some detail in the book. We've got a lot of charts, graphs, anecdotes, a very readable book for the average person who watches C-SPAN and is a little bit confused by what's going on. Uh, we think it's, we make a pretty cogent argue, argument for uh, some of the changes we've suggested. But most important, it just it describes how we got there for the average person. That you have, as I said, a lot of good people who can't do uh, really what they want to do because of the ex external forces that are on them, basically, if they want to win re-election. <clears throat> we start with this map here, which I'll get to a little later. That's the map of the um, uh, United States by the 2012 uh, presidential election. Red counties, the, the redder the county, the heavier the percentage uh, for Romney. The bluer the county, uh, the heavier the percentage for uh, Obama. These are the macro factors we describe in the book in some detail that have taken place over the last 15 to 20 years that have changed markedly politics in this country. First is the advent of the single party districts. Uh, we've always had them, but we've never had them as numerous as we have them today or, or as creatively drawn as we have them today. Um, <clears throat> there are three factors that go into this. and I'm just going to go through this kind of in a cursory way. We want to make this basically uh, discussional when Martin and I have kind of finished so we can talk about these and take it down to the fourth decimal point if you want. Um, the single party districts are, are three factors. One is what I call residential sorting patterns. You try to draw a Republican uh, district in a city or along the coast, it's almost impossible to find Republicans. So you've always had packed districts where people who live alike think alike, and you're just going to find uh, one, one party there. In the rural areas, it uh, tends to be uh, very Republican. Um, but there are two other factors. The Voting Rights Act, which came in, which basically uh, says you can't discriminate against minorities when drawing districts. So you end up packing minorities into districts so that they can represent these districts. You bleach the districts around it. The, the end result of that in the, deep, in the Deep South today is you have nothing but white Republicans and black Democrats. Uh, there are no more moderate uh, uh, white Democrats left in those areas because the only race these people in single party districts worry about is their party primary. General election is just irrelevant to their reelection prospects. This is 80% of the districts in the House and it's 60% of Senate seats. Uh, so uh, the, the November is nothing but what we say a constitutional formality they have to go through. But what that means for the average member is they focus their attention, they focus their rhetoric, they focus their voting records uh, basically on their primary voters who are a pretty thin ideological slice of the electorate and are pretty unforgiving about compromise. They want their members to stand tough, to stand tall, to stand for principle. And it's made it very hard, uh, and we will show a little later in this discussion, why the middle has just uh, given way. And then finally, gerrymandering, which is a new art form today, uh, the way that some of these districts are drawn. The only real requirement is you can't discriminate against minorities. That's statutory. And then constitutionally, each district has to have the same population. Um, and I'll get into that in a little more depth when I go after these, uh, I finish this slide. But the second map, if, this were, if they were just redistricting and, and drawing lines, we could come to grips with that. But there are two other factors that have emerged. One is we've seen uh, with the abolition of the equal time now that you have media business models that focus on people who think a certain way, and they feed it every day. We see it in cable news, we see it in talk radio, we see it on internet websites. These websites, uh, these, uh, some of these cable commentators, some of the talk radio commentators, they don't pretend to feed you straight news. This is, these are entertainment business models that are very successful, and they cater to people who think a certain way and want to hear it a certain way and get their fix every night. Uh, this has a, uh, an effect, though, on behavior. I'll just give you, a, we have a bunch of anecdotes in the book. We had a member from Virginia who had announced he was going to vote to reopen uh, the government uh, when it was shut down last year. He had a lot of federal employees in his district, most of them not primary voters. Uh, but he was held up on uh, one of the media stations as a traitor to the cause by caving in and voting. Uh, one of 18 traders, and his phone uh, switchboard lit up like a Christmas tree. Couldn't get, even get a phone uh, call out on his cell phone. People were so angry, and he had to walk back the statement. There's episode after episode of this uh, where the media models are now shaping uh, how members act because uh, their primary voters, a lot of them, take their cues from this. Um, <clears throat> And it, they said it's cable news, it's talk radio, and, and the internet, where there's no filters at all on the internet. We say that the crap to content ratio in the internet is very, very high. Uh, so many people thought that Obama was born in Kenya because we all saw his birth certificate from Kenya come over the internet. I started to believe it myself until somebody sent me his birth certificate uh, from Indonesia. And I said, this can't be right. Um, 
Um, but, but this is how people are receiving their news, and it makes it very hard for leaders to lead uh, when your media leaders, where these people are getting information every day, are telling them something different. That's not all, though. You've got a third factor that's come in, and that's the money in politics. With the advent of McCain-Feingold, which abolished this so-called soft money to the parties, the only group it hit was the parties. Anybody else can raise soft. Candidates and parties can't, but these outside groups can raise it in droves, and now we call it dark money. A lot of this money is raised. We don't even know where it comes from. At least when the parties raised it, it was disclosed. Um, and so the result of that is the money has shifted from the political parties, which have been a centering force in American politics for 200 years, out to the ideological wings, who now play in primaries and are empowered. And the parties are kind of sitting there taking wh whoever wins the, the nomination, but not getting into most of these nomination fights. And members live in fear of these interest groups coming into their primary where they can drop a million dollars. The member has to raise it uh, in, in increments of $2,600 at a time, at maximum. And it's, it's not even a fair fight. So the safe thing for members is I'm going to make, I'm sure I'm not going to tick these groups off. Uh, and so we see t behavior uh, in, in congressional voting where when these certain groups score these things, members just, they cave in and say, well, I'm, I'm going to vote with them. I had a member call me on the vote to reopen the government who was in the leadership, and he said, look, he said, uh, Club for Growth, Heritage Action, Freedom Works, they've scored this thing. He said, I have a primary opponent who's a uh, county commissioner. He said, look, I, I don't need these guys coming in and dumping a million dollars on me. I'm going to have to scramble if I do that. Right now, I've got it in hand. Uh, what should I do? And I said, well, it's going to pass anyway, right? He said, yeah. He said, well, you know, you can vote against it, and he did. Uh, his better, he wouldn't have, I think, if that had been the only vote that mattered. Uh, but he was not going to put himself at risk in, in an issue like that. We saw the same thing, uh, you know, with the hurricane in, in New Jersey, where members voted, wouldn't vote to give aid to Jersey because these groups had scored this as, as a deficit builder. We see this time and time again on the right and, and on, the, on the left. So these are the factors that have shaped things over uh, uh, the last 15 years. It, it's not just McCain-Feingold, by the way. It's the Citizens United case that came out of the Supreme Court, uh, which put this on steroids. These are some of the congressional districts I saw. This is, believe it or not, is a congressional district. It's the 12th district of North Carolina. It's, the, it's a voting rights district. This is a congressional district, believe it or not. That's the third district of Maryland. That's a gerrymandered district by the Democratic legislature in Maryland. This is Illinois' fourth district. We call this the Earmuff District. Uh, Congressman Gutierrez, this is a Hispanic district that combines two different Hispanic communities together to create a Hispanic majority district. This is Maryland's third district, again. I like this one. This is a Republican gerrymander, Pennsylvania's seventh district. Looks like a dog is kicking the other dog in the chest. <laughs> And I think if Picasso were to be alive today, he'd be into a congressional redistrictor. He wouldn't have to go into modern art to get these forms of, of expression. Um, also, another factor we point out in the book is that people are splitting their tickets less today than at any time in the last 100 years. It, it, we have a chapter called All Politics is No Longer Local, that in legislative elections, not, not governor's races or mayor's races, but in legislative elections, uh, people are voting the party, not the candidate. Now, I like to use this uh, just to point out that when you take a uh, if you take a look at where these are Democratic seats up here at the top that were up for re-election this last November in districts where Romney was 15 percent or greater, Republicans swept all those Democratic held seats. Where Romney was five points or better, they swept the seats. Where where uh, Obama won by less than five seats, the Republicans won one of two. The other race being the Virginia race, which was a shock to most people. Now I'm from Virginia. My congressional district, I wasn't shocked, uh, understanding that these are basically parliamentary races, and although Mark Warner had been a very successful and popular governor, uh, people just wanted a, a Republican, and he survived. He outspent his opponent in a significant way, but the tide almost took Mark Warner down, who was considered safe at the beginning of the cycle, and then the next two, Colorado and uh, Iowa, also went Republican, just kind of straight down the line. Uh, people voting for the party not the candidates. Candidates still matter uh, they, to some extent. Campaigns still matter, but to much less extent than they used to, given the fact that you have uh, so many people moving in and out of places today. The party is basically uh, uh, the determinative factor in uh, Senate and House races. 
Now, this is a survey that the National Journal, a, a widely respected uh, nonpartisan publication, does every year where they take the most liberal Republican in Congress and the most conservative Democrat in each House, and they say how many voters in their voting behavior on the House and Senate floors fall between that, and that is a very generous definition of what we would call moderates, members, are, uh, and so uh, as you take that, and you went back to 1982, there were 344 House members. Now, this is a very generous definition of moderate, members between the most uh, liberal Republican and the most conservative Democrat, but there were 344 of these members if you went back uh, to, to 1982. By 1994, there were 252. It was starting to fall. 2002, these factors are kicking in a little more. The business models have kicked in. Uh, it's 137. This last Congress is down to three. And of those three, uh, Matheson retired in, U in Utah, McIntyre retired in North Carolina, these are the three Democrats, and Barrow was defeated in Georgia. Uh, that is, uh, that, that's the way of, of, that, that things have uh, evolved on this. There's no credit for voting with uh, uh, the other side. Well, let's take a look at the Senate. The Senate, you had 58 members in a very broad definition in the middle of 1982. By 1994, there were 34. By 2002, there were seven. In the last three Congresses, zero. The most liberal Republican is more conservative than the most conservative Democrat. Basically, we have devolved into parliamentary behavior on the part of voters who put party ahead of candidates and on the part of members when they come to Washington voting a party line as opposed to individual uh, uh, views. Uh, the problem is we're not a parliamentary system, as Martin will explain. We're a balance of power system and it doesn't really work, uh, work very well. But what does it mean if we're a parliamentary system? It means when a member comes now and the president is your party, you are an appendage of the president. You're no longer a separate independent branch of government. You are with your president, right or wrong, and because you feel your destinies are intertwined and, and his success is your success, and the, the parties, this is both parties, they're just appendages of, of their president. The minority party, on the other hand, uh, no longer acts like a minority shareholder in government where they mitigate adverse effects uh, and where they'll try to tamp things down that are going out of control. The minority party is now the opposition party, and it's just no to everything. And that's why we had over 100 filibusters in the last Congress, and we're on our way to doing the same thing uh, in, in, in this Congress. Uh, that's the end result. Um, I use this to show that <coughs> divided government is the new norm. Uh, we talk about this in the book. We have a chapter on it. 80% of the time since 1980, we've had one party control the presidency and the other party control at least one House of Congress. The House today is uh, jerry-rigged, so the Democrats got 1.4 million more votes for the House uh, in uh, 2012 than the Republicans, uh, but the Republicans had a 17-seat edge. Democrats would have to carry about a four or five point percentage point lead to take the House the way the districts are currently drawn. It's advantage Republicans in the House but at the presidential level, it's advantage Democrats. These are the 18 states plus the District of Columbia that have now voted Democratic for president six straight times. We call these the blue wall states, and I'm gonna get back to this in a later chart, but pay attention to this. This is 242 electoral votes. You only need 270 to win. Now, Republicans have their own red wall. They have 13 states that have voted Republican um, six straight times. That's 102 electoral votes. So those are the red walls, but it's a, clearly a Democratic advantage when it comes to the Electoral College. It's not insurmountable. Republicans can win, but they have a much narrower path to, to victory given the current trends, which I don't think are likely to change overnight. I go back to the map again, it's definitive blood and blue areas. Why well, the, the blue areas and the rural areas are basically one of three types. College towns, majority minority counties, uh, these blue counties in the south right through here is what we call the black belts. These are African-American majority counties or college towns. And then we have what I call the granola belt, Aspen Vale, Sun Valley, Idaho, all heavy Democratic uh, strongholds. Your wealthiest precincts in this country uh, from Beverly Hills to Potomac, Maryland, Pound Ridge, New York, all heavily Obama. Uh, your poorest counties in Appalachia, uh, heavily Republican. Now, this is not about economics, folks. Despite the rhetoric, it's, uh, it's race, ethnicity, and culture tend to trump uh, economics, but they're pretty uh, decisive lines, and they've been forming this way and hardening over the last several cycles. Now, let's go to the blue wall. How does this map up in Senate races? Well, 
In Senate races, what we see in the blue wall is uh, 32 Democrats in the Senate, four Republicans, but three of these four Republicans were elected in the most Republican year since 1938, 2010, and they are up for election next time. Wisconsin, Illinois, and Pennsylvania, these three Republicans are at best even odds uh, to get reelected. Uh, Democrats likely, if they make pickups, to pick them up right here in these states that have been performing pr uh, Democratic at the presidential level, uh, filtering that down into Senate races. In, in the uh, red wall states, it's 25 to 1 uh, Republican. The one Democrat, Heidi Heidkamp from North Dakota, won by less than 1% and is considering running for governor, uh, not through the uh, Senate the next time. Uh, I use this just to say, well, what's on the horizon? These are the Senate seats that are up in 2016. Since 2010 was such a great Republican year, uh, you have uh, 24 Republican uh, uh, seats up and only 10 Democrats. Only two of these Democrats are in even are, are, are possibly takeable for the Republicans, uh, Harry Reid uh, in, in Nevada and uh, uh, Mike Bennett in Colorado. But you have seven Republicans that are in Brock, uh, that are in blue districts, three of them in blue wall states. What this means is Mitch McConnell's got to worry about holding his majority protecting these seven members. Uh, he's not interested in making points the way Boehner is in holding his raucous caucus together. They have, even though they're Republican leaders, each party uh, head has a different agenda this time if they want to protect their uh, uh, majorities. We can get to more in the Q&A. And uh, that's the good news from Washington. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Martin. Thank you. When, uh, when Tom talks about a parliamentary voting pattern, let me be clear what he's talking about. In parliamentary systems like we have in Europe and a number of other countries, the majority party, whichever party has the most seats in the legislature, in the parliament, or a combination or coalition of parties, gets to pick the prime minister. So you have unitary government. The same party controls both the executive branch and the legislative branch. That's not true in our system. We often have a president of one party and a Congress of another party, or at least one house of another party. So that um, we're, when, when he says people are voting like it's under a parliamentary system, they're not voting the way our system was designed. Our system was designed as checks and balances, and maybe the one party prevails a lot of the time, but they don't, they don't necessarily prevail all the time, and the executive branch also weighs in and has a right to, to its say, sometimes very different from the legislative branch. Now, let's talk about some of the solutions for the problems that we've outlined. Uh, Tom and I have a chapter at the end of the book where we talk about our recommendations. And again, he's a partisan Republican, I'm a partisan Democrat, but we do agree on a lot of things that have happened that have caused this system to have problems. And uh, I'll get to those in just a moment. But the problem that you have is, as Tom mentioned, about 80% of the congressional districts, House districts, are safe one-party districts because of gerrymandering and a variety of reasons. What does this mean? This means that if that someone is worried, not that they will necessarily, they're going to lose in a primary, most, most people don't lose in primaries, but they're worried they might lose in a primary and they change their voting pattern. So they don't want to get caught talking to the other side. They don't want to consider meeting in the middle, trying to work out compromises that are for the good of the country. Because if they do, then they'll face a serious, could face a very serious challenge in their own party primary, could be defeated. Uh, primaries are low turnout situations, so it doesn't take a lot of votes to swing a primary. Also, you have all these outside groups with all this extra money that's dumped into races at the end, and a lot of money coming into a congressional district, relatively low turnout district, can sway the election. So that members live in mortal fear uh, Republicans fear that someone from the far right is going to run against them in the primary, and Democrats fear, fear that someone from the far left is going to run against them in the primary, so they don't talk to each other. They don't try and reach compromises on key issues like keeping the government open, like funding the Department of Homeland Security. This is nuts what's going on right now, whether you're a Democrat or Republican. We are under threat. People want to attack our country, and yet we're considering not fund, vote, voting funding uh, the, in, in a couple of days to keep the Department of Homeland Security open. I mean, I, I don't understand that, and I don't understand it from either a Democratic or a Republican standpoint. You would hope that those folks in Washington could come together and figure out how to keep our country safe. Now, so what do we suggest? 
One of the things we're suggesting is that Congress pass a law requiring every single state to do what was done here in California. Now, you all may not approve of the California system, the recent one, but it's an experiment. And states are the laboratory of experiments in our country. Some of the best ideas often come from state governments, not from the federal government. What California and five, four other states do right now is to have bipartisan commissions which draw line congressional districts. They aren't drawn just by one party in the legislature. And California does that, Arizona does it, Iowa does it, the uh, state of Washington, and the state of New Jersey. Uh, the results in those five states have not been bad. They haven't been perfect, but they haven't been bad. And we'll see how this system operates over a period of time in California. You have a diff an extra wrinkle in your system and that the top two candidates are in a runoff. And so that you could have two candidates of the same party. You could have two Democrats or two Republicans in the final election. What that means is, let's say you have two Republicans who make the finals in a particular congressional district, they have to talk to people on the other side. They have to go out and try and get Democratic votes in addition to their Republican votes. And if you have two Democrats who are in the finals, they have to talk to Republicans because they're not going to win it just with Democratic votes. So it, it causes people to at least consider speaking to the other side, and hopefully you'll have fairer districts that aren't uh, gerrymandered so that they're going to automatically produce a particular result. Now, Right now, the Republicans have an advantage because they won a majority of the state legislatures in 2010, the last time congressional districts were drawn. But that's not permanent. Legislatures are reelected all the time. And 10 years from now, in, the next, in 2020, the shoe could be on the other foot. Democrats could win a majority of the state legislatures, and then you would have Democratic gerrymanders, and you might have a situation where the Republicans would get a majority of the votes cast, just as the Democrats did in 2012, but wind up with less than a majority of the seats. So we think it's a fairer system. We've talked to constitutional authorities who say that Congress does have the power, if it chooses to do so, to require bipartisan commissions to draw congressional districts. Now, what else would we do? One is this, uh, another thing is this question of the dark money in politics. Tom and I both questioned and challenged the McCain-Feingold law when it was passed uh, in about uh, 2002. The reason we did this was because, as Tom mentioned, prior to that time, the political parties could raise large contributions from unions, from corporations, and from individuals, but they had to report every penny of that. Every penny. I was, I was chairman of the DCCC, Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. If we raised a large contribution, we had to report that. We had to file that with the FEC so everybody knew where the money was coming from. Now, as a result of McCain-Feingold, that money's been taken away from political parties, and that money then goes to, the fr to groups on the fringe who don't have to report all that money. Some of them have to report it, depending upon how it's spent, but a lot of the money is not reported, and so you as a voter have no idea who these groups are that are coming in at the last minute and spending a million dollars on the air in the last week or two in your congressional district, uh, and they have these funny names that don't mean anything, and you have no idea who the people are who are putting this money up. So we're suggesting that Congress simply ought to pass a law saying that any, any group that mentions a federal candidate by name in an election year, has to report all of its contributors. Seems, seems reasonable to me, it seems reasonable to Tom, but will Congress do that? We don't know. Now, some people have suggested that, well, one of the problems is this Citizens United case, which permits corporations and labor unions to make unlimited contributions to these outside groups and to spend unlimited amounts on their own, too, as independent expenditures. And people say, well, why don't we just, why don't we, amend the Constitution to override the Supreme Court on Citizens United. The problem with that, it is damn hard to amend the Constitution in this country. It almost never happens. You have to, uh, Congress has to pass an amendment by a two-thirds vote of each house, and then it has to be ratified by three-quarters of the states, and it's almost impossible to change a provision in our Constitution. Now, that's been a strength of our system. That's why we have a stable form of government. I often I speak to students all the time, and I point out to them that while we were a government founded in a revolution by revolutionaries, those revolutionaries set up a very conservative form of government. They made it hard to get anything done that was intentional on their part. 
bill has to pass the House, it has to pass the Senate, it goes to a conference committee, it comes back out, it passes, the, each House votes on it again, it goes to the President, the President can either sign or veto, if he vetoes, then you have to get two-thirds of each House to override the veto. It is real hard to change laws in this country, either by statutorily, and it's particularly real hard to amend the Constitution. So you're not going to tomorrow going to amend the Constitution to address any of these remedy, any of these problems that people see in our finance system, but you could require disclosure. Congress could do that if it chose to do so. Now, one of the other things that we recommended is that you have a, a national primary date for the House and the Senate, not for presidents. St states could have their presidential primaries whenever they want to, but that all the primaries in every state would, uh, for U.S. Congress and for the Senate would be held on the same day. And the reason for this is that the media would then pay more attention to what's going on, and presumably you would have a larger turnout with no guarantee, but at least it might encourage bigger turnouts in our party primaries. We've also suggested something that is controversial. Um, and we wrote an op-ed piece that was in the Los Angeles Times about a week ago. I don't know if any of you all saw it. Uh, and it dealt with the issue of earmarks. Now, what's an earmark? An earmark is when a member of the House or the Senate during an appropriations bill gets to specify that a particular project is funded doesn't leave the decision to the executive branch. It, that member of Congress gets to say, I want this project for my district or for my state. Now, this was abused in the past. There was a congressman from San Diego, uh, Randy Duke Cunningham. You may have heard about him. He actually accepted bribes from defense contractors to earmark funds to go for, defense, for, uh, for certain defense projects. That's against the law, and he went to jail, and he should have gone to jail for that. We're not suggesting people ought to be able to take bribes to earmark funds, particularly if they're for projects that aren't in their districts. What we're suggesting is that if you have earmarks, that a, a member of Congress has to put his or her name on it. You have to know who requested that money, and it can only go for a project in the congressman's district or in his home state if he's a senator. Now, Though I don't know how many of you travel to Washington very often. Uh, there are a series of bridges across the Potomac River. That's how people get to work in Washington. It's not quite as bad as the congestion on the freeways out here, but it's pretty bad. And so you, one of those bridges was the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. It was in very poor repair. It was an old bridge. It was almost falling down. So Tom Davis got an earmark to repair that bridge, to modernize it. And now you have, it's, it, it, it carries traffic a lot more easily, a lot easier. I had a request from the business community in my district in Dallas, Texas some years ago. Dallas was one of the largest cities in the country. It didn't have mass transit. And they just, the business community decided it would be good for business if we could have above ground light rail in Dallas. And so I was able to get an earmark to build something called DART, Dallas Area Rapid Transit. It's patterned after BART, the Bay, Bay Area Rapid Transit. So Dallas now has a very fine light rail system because it was an earmark. Now, earmarks don't add to total spending. That's a myth. What they do is they only take the, the spending that had already been decided upon and permit a small portion of that to be directed by Congress to specific projects. It's usually about 1 or 2% of the total amount appropriated actually gets earmarked. And if you don't have earmarks by Congress, somebody in the executive branch is going to earmark, going to make those decisions. And if you like the Obama administration being able to make all those decisions, uh, that's fine. But s some people don't want any, any president, any executive branch, whether it's Obama or whether it be a Republican president, to make all decisions about how money is spent in this country. And um, it is not unusual that whichever party is in power, the executive branch directs a lot of money into states that are important to that political party and particularly into states that are purple, that are up for grabs. And so this would at least give Congress the say, some say, over how that money's spent. Uh, and we have a variety of other recommendations. Um, you know, one of the things that Tom talked about is the internet and, and, and uh, extreme media in this country. Uh, I used to be a reporter. I have a journalism degree, and I worked as a magazine, newspaper, magazine, and television reporter. And I believe in free press. I, I'm not for, for government censorship. What we have to understand is the system we now have and, and what the implications of that system on producing deadlock in our country, in our government. When I was elected in 1978, 
uh, we didn't have C-SPAN. The C-SPAN cameras were turned on in March of 79 during my first term. So you can now turn on your TV if you want to, if you're sitting around the house and you don't have anything else to do, and you can watch congressional debates. In June of 1980, during my first term, CNN went on the air. Prior to that, you did not have any all news cable stations. And sometime in the late 80s, 87, 88, somewhere along in that line, the internet went online. We wouldn't have the internet before that. And uh, you know, you get a lot of crazy stuff on the internet, as, 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 as Tom has indicated, some of which is not true. Uh, I have cousins in Texas who used to send me just the wildest things they had read, they'd seen on the internet, some terrible thing about Congress, and I had to point out that, well, what you sent me is not exactly true. Let me tell you what the truth is. And we're not going to change that system. We're not going to impose censorship in this country. But we do have to understand that people are, have an awful lot of, in, a lot more information at their fingertips. And that information is often now strictly highly partisan, whether it's from cable TV or whether it's from talk radio or whether it's on the internet. And we really have to work hard to get our citizens to understand what's really going on in Washington. I had a colleague, congressional colleague, uh, for some years. Well, his name was Bill Lehman, L-E-H-M-A-N. He was from Miami, Florida. Bill had been a used car dealer before he was elected to Congress. Uh, he was uh, Alabama Bill. He had got, he's actually he was from Alabama, but he wound up in South Florida. So he, he traded under the name of Alabama Bill. And when he was elected to Congress, he said he didn't think he could f uh, fall any lower in public esteem when he was a used car dealer, and then he became a congressman. <laughs> um, the problem is, and that was when the congressional approval rating was in the 30s or so. Now it's down to 7%. You know, those are friends and family and, and employees. Uh, you know, that's all that think Congress is doing a good job. But, but unfortunately, it's, it's, not, it's not funny because we need to have confidence in our system of government. Somehow we as citizens need to feel like our, our system can work, is working, and is acting in the best interest of all the people. And that if there's a really tough problem, Congress can figure this out. Right now, Congress doesn't do a very good job of figuring anything out, and that, that doesn't make any difference whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Uh, you want Congress to at least address the major problems facing the country. And we're suggesting that there's some structural changes that could be made. There are other changes. We're open to other ideas. But we cannot continue, I don't believe, and Tom doesn't believe, you can't continue the way the current system is, or we will not be the greatest. We're the greatest country in the world you know, on the face of the earth. We'd like to stay that way, quite frankly. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just unfortunate what's in the process of happening to our system of government. We are the, most people don't know this, we are uh, of the current democracies in the world. Now, not every country is a democracy, but of the current democracies, we are the oldest continuous democracy in existence. You think, well, what about Great Britain? Well, Great Britain didn't empower the House of Commons until the 1830s. Uh, we were already set up as a democracy, you know, in the, in the 1790s. So we are the oldest running democracy in the world. We've been a great country. We want to, Tom and I are both optimistic. We think our country it will continue to be great, but we would like to see something done to make our Congress function, function again, and for the public to have confidence that our system's going to work. So let me uh, stop. Uh, Tom, why don't you come back up here, and we'll take questions. Um, <clears throat> Whoever would like to ask a question, when we're through, uh, Ken, is there a table out there where people will be able to sign books? And I will tell you that uh, Tom's handwriting is better than mine, so he'll be the one who will write the inscription to whoever it is. He'll sign his name, and then I'll sign my name. But we'll get on with that in a minute. We'll take First, can we, let's give him a round of applause.